Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, live Q&A this morning with Cassie. Um, so hopefully we've got some people joining us from both Australia and also overseas from the United States and Canada. So good morning to the Australians and uh, good evening to everybody on the northern, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so today we're going to be doing a live Q&A. Um, we're going to, we've opened it up to an Ask Anything Q&A. So that basically means that we don't have a specific topic that we're going to kind of cover off on today, but rather we're just going to throw it out there to you and um, you can ask your questions uh, that you have about your parrot's behaviour, husbandry, training. Uh, obviously there are, you know, certain questions we may not be able to answer due to the format, but we will try and do as the best that we can with what, with what we've got. Uh, so today we've got Cassie here with us. Cassie is um, over in Florida in the United States. Uh, she has a really, really cool long background, over 20 years working with parrots professionally. So I'm going to introduce Cassie now. She can tell us a little bit more about um, her background and where she comes from and how she got into parrot training. Welcome, Cassie. Thank you, Lee. Hi, everybody. I am super excited to be here with you all today. Uh, like Lee said, I have quite an extensive history, 20 plus years in animal training. Uh, I started out in the world of animal training right out of college. I moved to Orlando and started with a company called Natural Encounters, which many of you may have heard of, Steve Martin's Natural Encounters. And I started with them at Disney's Animal Kingdom. And I actually uh, was lucky enough to start two weeks before Disney's Animal Kingdom opened to the public, which is pretty amazing. So I got to be on the opening team of this awesome theme park. And we, uh, Natural Encounters does a couple of shows at Disney's Animal Kingdom. They do a mixed species free flight bird show. And uh, that features all different kinds of birds from all over the world. And then they also have a show called Winged Encounters, which uh, flies a flock of about 25 to 30 macaws through the park. Uh, several times a day, which is a really awesome experience. And um, with Natural Encounters, I also uh, was able to travel quite a bit. So for um, Natural Encounters does quite a few other things other than the shows at Disney. Uh, they also do shows in zoos across the country. Um, and I've had the opportunity to set up free flight bird shows in many places across the U.S., um, Virginia, Oklahoma, Toledo, Oklahoma, yes, Toledo, um, National Aviary in Pittsburgh, so many great places. And um, then I also had the opportunity to consult both at zoos in the US and abroad. And I've also done lots of presentations at conferences and workshops. And then finally, um, also uh, Natural Encounters does workshops for zoo professionals and companion parrot owners. And so I've also done quite a few workshops where I'm teaching people to train birds. Uh, so I did that for just over 20 years and then had a COVID career change. And that's when I started um, Awesome Animal Solutions, which is my personal animal training and consulting business. And that's also when I linked up with Jen Kuna from Parrot Kindergarten. And that was um, just an amazing and super fortunate opportunity for me uh, to be able to join this brand new adventure. Uh, for many of you that have heard of Parrot Kindergarten, there might even be some members that are here with us today. Uh, it is an awesome program. It's for anybody and everybody that loves parrots and shares their home with a parrot. It offers uh, not only the opportunity for community, so community sharing and collaboration, uh, but it also offers you just so many opportunities to uh, grow your relationship with your birds and just um, help them to live their best life. So that's been my new adventure and that's some of the things that I'm super excited about. Uh, as far as my work with parrots in particular, I've uh, worked with, my gosh, hundreds of parrots in my many years. Um, uh, macaws, cockatoos, uh, cockatiels, Amazon parrots, African greys, uh, quite a variety. And uh, they're very near and dear to my heart. So I am very excited to be here today and hopefully help answer some questions for everybody. 
thanks for sharing all of that. That's such an incredible journey that you've had um, with your parrots. So I have to, with, with your career in general. So, um, yeah, 20 years and travelling all over and working in um, some really incredible, obviously, very famous free flight shows um, at Disney and that, so which is, you know, a very cool experience. Uh, did, you know, sounds like you, you know, did you come out of college and you studied animal training or animal behaviour in that setting and you kind of came out and managed to snag yourself an awesome job on your way out? Yeah, you know, it's funny. So I grew up an only child, so my best friends were my dogs and the animals in the neighbourhood. And so I always wanted to be and work around animals. Um, when I... Gosh, I, I went into college and I got some intern. I got an internship at a local zoo by me, and I really thought my career was headed to towards the path of zookeeper. And I started applying at some zoos. And while I was applying for jobs, Natural Encounters came up, and I had always wanted to live and work in Florida. Um, I had hopes of going to Disney's Animal Kingdom because I loved Florida, but I didn't have any experience. Uh, and Natural Encounters also talked about training and conservation and education and travel. And so I was like, you know, sign me up, let me interview. And I interviewed with them. And during the interview, they said, do you have any questions for us? And at the time I said, do you have anything other than birds? Because I, you know, I had this view of working with all sorts of animals, you know, and um, birds was never necessarily a passion for me. Animals was my passion, you know, and um, they laughed. They said they had some rats and the rats were in the show, uh, which was pretty fun. And I, you know, I got the job. I went down there and it changed my world as far as birds go, because um you know, had I had the opportunity, I always loved big cats, you know, and I think had I had the opportunity to go work with big cats in a zoo, maybe I would have worked with 10 to 12 individuals. And having the opportunity yeah. to work with Natural Encounters at this bird show at Disney with approximately 150 birds, every single bird had their own personality. And, you know, a king vulture was so different from a ground hornbill, was so different from a scarlet macaw. You know, they were all so different. And then even within that, each individual had their own personality. And so once I realized how awesome that was, it was it was really hard to, to turn away from that. And then the other thing too, because they do free flight, um, it was constantly challenging me and I love a, a good challenge. You know, I'm not somebody that really sits still for very often. So, you know, just the <laughs> challenge of, of, you know, flexing those brain muscles every day to create an environment where the birds choose to come home, you know, <laughs> was, yeah. um, was really awesome and really spectacular. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the history of it. And then one thing I also, um, forgot to mention, uh, Steve was also uh, one of the founding members of the International Association of Avian Trainers and Educators. And so um, he allowed his staff to join if they wanted to. So uh, I took advantage of any of those opportunities. So I joined and I've actually been on the executive board of the IAATE, I think since 2004. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So that's been really cool, too, because I've gotten to sit on the board of this bird focused organization and just watch the whole um, profession grow, you know, and, and just see bird welfare just continue to grow, you know, year after year. So it's all been really, really rewarding. Fantastic. So, yeah, giving back a lot as well through your through your um membership there and through being on the board and, and helping improve welfare, which is awesome. Um, I, I've got one last question, but then we've got a question from someone watching. But I just okay. wanted to ask, what was your favourite bird to work with during your time uh, at NEI? That's so funny. I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> only because... It could be a because, species. It doesn't have to yeah. be a specific individual. Is there that's, a specific species? Yeah, that's the hard part, right? Because okay. there, there were so many. Um, you know, when I think about species, um, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why, 
Um, well, I mean, I can wonder. Um, the Abyssinian ground hornbills always stole my heart. I think part of it is because I was petrified of that. I was afraid of birds when I first started. I was, <laughs> I was really afraid of birds. Um, and the ground hornbills I was so afraid of. And we had a show modification and all the birds got sent to our ranch facility and they had a vacation. And one of the trainers talked me into coming over there and going in with all of these birds with these where's my camera super giant long beaks you know and it got me over my fear and it helped me realize how social they were and so I was really drawn to that uh and then of course likewise uh with the parrots I was really drawn to that as well um but I would say my my most favorite bird and you see it in all my my headshots is always Pogo uh that little sulfur crested cockatoo that I had the honor to work alongside uh, that bird is currently, gosh, 53, 54 oh, wow. years old. And he taught me so much, so much. He was just so brilliant and such a great teacher and such a great learner. And our routine was, it just required such a connection between us. And he he always amazed me with just how how yeah there's the abyssinian ground hornbill i thought oh. some people may not know what that is so i'll bring a photo yeah. up so people can kind of see as yeah, yeah. so if you're afraid of birds that's definitely <laughs> yeah tough yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But, but so i mean their eyelashes and their coloring they were just they're such a unique interesting bird but yeah i yeah. love them and yeah pogo that little cockatoo he he was a great teacher and mentor for me over the years so Definitely my Amazing. favorite. Sure. Yeah. Have you had a chance to come to Australia and see them in the wild? Or? Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't know if you know Gray Fisher over at Taronga Zoo. Um, him and I worked together at Natural Encounters and we were really close friends and we stayed close. And I had the opportunity to um, speak at one of the parrot conferences in Australia. And we also brought a little IAATE symposium to Australia. So I got to go there for that. And um, when I was there, Gray and I took some vacation time. Both times I got to go. And so I got to see the cockatoos. I got, we went to Tasmania and we saw flocks of hundreds of galahs, which was wow. amazing. I have some funny video of a greater sulfur crest um, flying at my camera at Centennial Park. <laughs> They're cheeky, uh, cheeky, cheeky birds. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was amazing. Yeah, so Centennial Park. I love Park how much was... you guys appreciate them because I chased them out of my veggie garden a couple of days ago. I was like, get out of the garden, guys. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's such a different world. It's such a different world. I, I absolutely love Australia so much, so much. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, all right, we've got a couple of questions. So I'm going to pop them up on the screen um, so we can start answering some of these questions. So... Diana Hyde says, thank you for offering this. One of my challenges is getting my Quaker, Cody, to stay on a station. He tends to fly off. He knows to station I bridge and offer food rewards, safflower seeds, many, in fact, for being a good boy and hoping to get him to stay stationed until I release him. He also turns around for me and then he flies off at will. Thanks. All right. Awesome. So I'll leave that. Got, got some tips there for Diane? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I have some clients currently right now that have little birds. And what I'm seeing in our sessions is that these little birds are super fast learners. And I think one of the challenges we have sometimes is keeping up with them. They're sometimes ready to go before we are. And so when I think about asking a bird to station, uh, I think about building duration. So in the simplest sense, that means that you, uh, let's say you're going to uh, say good and deliver a treat when your bird is on station. So you would say station and then you would say good, treat. And then to build duration, it might look something like good, treat, good, treat, good, treat good treat. And so you're systematically lengthening the amount of time between treats. Um, what I've also found works really well is as you're starting to lengthen that time to vary it as well. So something I like to recommend is maybe counting to yourself so you know that you're building duration. So one treat, one treat, 
one, two, treat, one, two, three, treat. And then to vary it, maybe you give a treat after three beats and then after one beat and then after four beats and then after two beats. So you're building in some variety into that duration. Um, now that's like, the basic way to think about it. But sometimes when you have a bird that's a super fast learner, asking them to sit still and do nothing for an extended period of time can be really difficult. So something that can help is finding other things for your bird to do while on station. Um, that could be playing with a foraging toy um, or a shreddable toy or any other type of toy, but it could also be asking them to do other things. So while you're on station, can you turn? While you're on station, can you wave? While you're on station, can you put this object in this other place? So trying to find other things to keep him busy at that same time might also help if your situation is a bird that's just ready to learn so fast that we need to try and catch up. What do yes. you think, Lee? I agree. All of that is exactly what I recommend as well. Um, I think sometimes uh, we, we don't start with a high enough rate of reinforcement in that initial, like, building the duration period. Um, and then I think where people sometimes get stuck is that they constantly increase the requirement rather than varying it like you just pointed out where you do a couple of beats then you go a little bit less and a little bit more then a little bit less again and build it up that way um, because I find that they you know they are so intelligent and like you said such fast learners that pretty quickly they start going oh this is just you know you're just making me wait longer and longer and longer um, and it's just getting harder but I'm still working for the same amount of food <laughs> so um, yeah so all of that but also yeah making that that space where we want them to spend time interesting because they are parrots and they're very inquisitive and active and sitting still for long periods of time isn't, uh, you know, isn't their strong suit. So, right. Yeah. Awesome. Anything cool. else to add to that one? Otherwise we do have another question. Nope. I'm good. Awesome. Okay. So Sam has asked, do you think birds do well alone or better with buddies? I have a cup. I have a kaiik, and we love him to bits. But I hate leaving him alone when I go to work. Sometimes would it be healthier for him to have a flock apart from myself and my family? Really good question, Sam. So I'll let Cassie dive into that. Yes, that is a great question. So um, when I think about um, sharing our lives with parrots, I think about that parrots are different from dogs and cats in that they haven't been domesticated for a very long time. And so when I look to solving behavior challenges, I look to parrots in the wild. And it is true that you rarely see a parrot alone in the wild. Most often you're seeing them in pairs or small family groups and sometimes even larger groups at foraging areas. So when it comes to having a parrot in your home, when you're looking at the choice to offer a buddy to your parrot, um, I think that that's a great option. But for me, I always think that, well, I know there are some countries that you have to have a buddy for your parrot. You, it's illegal to have one parrot, which I think is very interesting. And I think that that speaks to, you know, a part of what's best for the birds. Um, but what they're getting at there in that law is that these birds um, are not lone animals. And so when you're making the decision to bring another bird into your home, I think it's important to look at your family structure and weigh the pros and cons and see what, we, what would be best for your situation. Because um, if you have a parrot uh, and you really enjoy that one-on-one -on -one time and that parrot-human bond is really, really important to you, Sometimes when you bring another parrot into the home, your parrot may choose to bond with that other bird, which means that your parrot is now not looking for that same need from you. They get it from the other bird. And for some people, that can be hard because they feel like they've lost some sort of connection with their bird. Um, other people are okay with it because they see that the bird is happily bonded to another bird. Um, the other thing to consider is what happens if you get another bird and they don't get along and now you have two birds that don't get along. Um, even if they don't get along, maybe there is a benefit to being in the same room and chatting or seeing each other, even if they can't be out together. Um, so that's always something to think about, you know, how to try and set up your environment 
to hope that this second bird and your first bird uh, get along. Um, I have one client, they have two cockatiels and one of the cockatiels only wants to do is be with cockatiel B and cockatiel B only wants to be with people. He's not a bird bird, he's a people bird. So you have an interesting dynamic in that house where cockatiel A wants to be with B and B wants to be with person. Um, but they work it out and they work around it and you know they change how their family dynamic is to make sure everybody's happy. So um, I don't think it's a hard black and white answer. I think it, it definitely depends. Can that increase um, the quality of life for your bird? Yes. Uh, are there challenges involved and um, things to consider? Absolutely. Yep. Yes, exactly. I think that's it. Sometimes it's not as simple as I'm going to get a bird and because my bird is a bird, it's going to like this other bird. <laughs> and so there are lots of complexities in there about, you know, what happens if this they don't get along um, and then I'm going to have to split my time between two birds. So then is it really increasing the first bird's welfare if now I only have half as much time to spend with them because have to do the other half with this other bird um, and I'm going to add, add a little question on there because I think it's relevant um, I you know obviously personally I think how we introduce birds to each other is incredibly important uh, so do you have tips for people that are looking at adding a second bird for the you know for the purpose of I want them to be company for each other I'd like them to get along what are some good tips to do introductions for new birds to help set everybody up for success well, you know, I, I start at the beginning and I wonder, like, I know people have concerns about cross-contamination and things like that, but I wonder, like, are there rescues or facilities where they, you know, you, uh, the, the, my clients with the cockatiels, for example, we had this, like, blue sky thought of what if they could bring this cockatiel a who loves birds to a cockatiel rescue and put him in this aviary and see who he paired up with that liked him and bring that bird home like wouldn't that just be wonderful but i i don't know if that's realistic you know so you know the next thing that i think about is um you know i would start with the cages far enough away so that the birds have comfortable body language i would look at if you have the opportunity to introduce them in a neutral space um i look at you know i i recommend like at night when you put your birds uh before you put your birds to bed if you clean their cage and clean their paper so in the morning you can tell by the poop pile where they're sleeping i look to see are they sleeping closer to the other bird um, I'll also set up perches in their enclosures so they have that option so they can sleep on the, you know, shared wall, as they say. Um, and I, I would just be watching their body language and watching their behavior. Um, you know, there's things that you can train. You can train station training and delivering treats for, you know, stationing your birds as far away from each other as they're comfortable and then approximating to closer at their comfort level. And you can be doing that with their enclosures as well, where you bring the cages closer and closer as you see that relationship happen until the cages are, you know, close enough that you can see they might get along. If you decide to house them together, I always say the bigger cage is better, a new, neutral, big enough cage where everybody has enough space to get away from each other, making sure everybody, each bird has their own food and water. So if one bird is kind of nudging another bird out of the food bowl, they have another food bowl they can go to. Um, space to hide, you know, like if there's a favorite toy, maybe two of the same toy so that, you know, I try and decrease competition when I'm introducing them into a new shared environment. And I also just want to make sure they have enough space to get away. And um, I do a lot of monitoring, a lot of observation. Uh, nowadays, you know, you can get these uh, so many different Wi-Fi cameras so you can check in on your birds from your phone. Um, so there's a lot you can do to kind of set it up step by step and develop a plan to hopefully try and make that uh, introduction successful. Awesome. What do you think? Thanks. So. Yeah, that's a lot of the same sort of stuff that I recommend. I think it's important to make those first intros as positive as possible. Try to avoid um, competition, as you say, and um, 
and create lots of positive experiences around each other. So um, I think some of the, the biggest issue that a lot of people come up on is that they have a bird that's very bonded to them already. Um, and then they add a second bird and there might be some competition around the human's attention. And that can be a little bit more challenging um, because when the human is present, everybody wants the human. <laughs> uh, but so do you have any tips for that for, for people that might be struggling with birds that both love the human and, <laughs> and are struggling to share that, that attention? Yeah, uh, one of my favorite things that seems to be working well, especially if you're looking at um, environments and situations where uh, you're hoping that the birds will be out of their cages and near each other, is uh, station training. And so if your birds, um, I, have, I have one client where their birds are bonded and they want to work with the birds. So in that case, each bird, and these are little birds, little conures, so they're on a, um, a table stand perch and their perches are very close to each other because they will work for, for the person as long as they're near each other. Whereas some birds, it's the opposite. You might have to station them far enough away that they're not vying for competition. But again, for me, you know, I'm, I'm always somebody who looks at observable behavior, you know. So I'm, if, if I'm training my bird over here and I see this bird over here is showing behaviors that I would describe as anxious or attention getting or, you know, pick me, pick me, pick me, then I need to work more with that bird so that I'm not allowing those types of behaviors to be practiced, which might lead to, hey, now I'm going to chase this guy off the perch because you're not paying attention to me. So if I have a bird that has a higher uh, need, I'm going to find a way to make sure that I've asked this bird to do a behavior and then maybe they have a bowl instead of hand feeding so I can drop three or four treats in that bowl. So while that bird is eating, I can do a little bit with this bird. Oh, he's done eating. Okay, will you spin? Great. Here's a, a Nutriberry that might take a little longer to eat. Okay, we're going to do some work. So it's definitely a challenge. I mean, you know, working professionally with large numbers of birds and doing shows, you learn to train your bird while you're delivering dialogue and train the other bird and train, you know, manage the audience. But it's a, it's definitely a skill that takes practice and uh, it's not easy at first, <laughs> you know, it definitely takes some, yeah. it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Those are some really good tips though, because um, I think people struggle with that sometimes and they're not sure how to get the birds to work together. And uh, yeah, stationing on, on separate stands and, and teaching them to, I guess I call it like wait your turn and, and working with them simultaneously, but one bird's kind of waiting while the other bird is engaging in some active um, training and then switching it around can be really helpful. Yes. And, and on that too, you know, I always say whenever you give your bird a treat, you're telling them good. I love that. Do that again. And so if you are training one bird and you see the other bird patiently waiting, that's a great opportunity to give them another treat just for waiting patiently. Oh, look how well you're stationing with duration. Great job. Keep up the good work. And that'll help strengthen it too. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Really good tips. Cool. Okay. So we've got a question from Emily. I'm just going to pop that up on the screen. So Emily says she has a rescue major Mitchell who has always been afraid of us and novel items as in, if I move something on the other side, I'm oh, sorry, other side of the room, he can get scared and fly at random into his cage. He's a bit better now, but only trusts my husband who spends less time with him, but hasn't crated him. Out of necessity, I have crated him to move between indoor and outdoor areas for safety previously. But the last time was a year ago and the most I can get from him is a big rub with a single finger though. I'm just going to double check there's not something missing from there from my screen. Okay. Oh, popping that up. Yep. Yeah. Um, most I can get from him is beak rub with a single finger through the cage. I've done target training with him, with him in a cage and myself outside, but I can't get past that. As soon as the door is open, he doesn't trust. He will walk on hubby and groom him. Um, so trying to rebuild that trust after having crated him. And, and so he's uncomfortable as soon as Emily enters <clears throat> his space by the sounds of it. Any tips for that? 
Yeah, Emily, it sounds like you have a good handle on on uh, certain pieces of this for sure. You're understanding that this bird is more comfortable with your husband. Um, one of the things that might help you is to do your training sessions when your husband isn't around. This way there's not that um, what we call competing reinforcer. So when your husband's around, even though this bird might do some target training for you, if I open the cage, he's gonna go right to my husband. So in that situation, I would say, okay, well, I'm not gonna open the cage. I'll just do inside the cage work for this session. And I will consider opening the cage during sessions when my husband's not around. So that, that might give you a bit of success. Um, but it's definitely a trust challenge and it definitely sounds like um, there's some trust building that can happen that will help you out. Uh, one of the things that has been kind of a, uh, gained a lot of traction in the animal training world is this idea of the trust account. And it came from uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Um, but it's been applied really well to the animal world. And the way I describe it is you can think about your relationship with your bird like a piggy bank. And every time you and your bird have a positive experience together, uh, you ask your bird to touch the target and you deliver a treat, you're putting coins into that piggy bank and you're building trust. Um, every time you ask your bird to do something that he doesn't wanna do, like force him into a crate, it's as if you're pulling the plug and you're shaking out some coins, you're shaking out some trust. And the challenge with it is that it's not one-to-one. -one. So for example, we do some target training. I put in, let's say, I ask you to target five times and I put in five coins and then I force you to go into a crate. I'm not necessarily dumping out one coin or five coins. I might be dumping out 50 coins. So if there's only five coins in the bank, I don't even have enough. So that's where we say that the trust account is bankrupt, right? So we need to add more coins. We need to build the trust. When that bank is overflowing, um, if you make a mistake, if you move too fast, if you come by the cage too fast, um, if something that you do uh, scares your bird, it doesn't have as much as an effect because there's so much trust that's built up. So one of the ways that I um, love to build trust is target training. I think that that's a great first step. And once you're at the point where your bird will follow the target all the way around the cage, uh, then you can experiment with new things. So you can use that target stick to ask your bird to touch or play with a toy that's in their enclosure. Um, you can ask, ask them to explore a toy that they haven't ever really played with before. Or you can use that target to introduce new food items. Here's my new food item. Here's my target stick. And as they're touching the stick, I'm bringing the two together. And then will you try this new food item? Um, the other thing is if you haven't checked out Para Kindergarten, uh, there's so many awesome things that you can do with your bird while your bird is inside the cage. Uh, you can teach color discrimination, shape discrimination. You can read books. Uh, you can do tablet games. There's so many things things that you can do. And the beauty of that program <clears throat> and why we see relationships grow with the birds is because you're coming to the table, you're showing up, you're giving these birds the attention that they would like, you're giving them treats, and you're also teaching them something new. And when I just did our recent step up training workshop uh, for parrot kindergarten, what I explained to people is that stepping up or getting on us, being on us or with us is the most challenging behavior that we ask our parrots to do. And it requires the highest level of trust. Uh, again, when we think about parrots in the wild, I think about when I ask a parrot to step on my hand or my arm or whatever it might be, and then I think about this bird in the wild. In the wild, when this bird is perched on a perch, a branch, this is a strong, solid wood branch. It feels the way it feels and it doesn't move. Our hands move, our fingers move, we twitch, we have a heartbeat. Sometimes our skin moves when our birds are on us. So we're a very variable thing and it requires a lot of trust for them to be in our space like that. And so what I challenged people was, think about every single behavior that you would like your parrot to do and develop a plan for training it with treats without that bird getting on your body. 
And if you get creative and you do perch training, well, I want my bird to come with me upstairs to the bathroom to take a shower. Well, you can train your bird to stand on a perch that you can carry with you to different places. And that builds trust because that perch is always the same no matter who's holding it. So it's a lot easier for that bird to build confidence in the perch and then through that confidence in the perch, start to build more confidence in the person that's holding the perch. Um, so I, I do think that there's really uh, endless possibilities. It just takes a little bit of creativity and thinking about how to set up the environment to um, start finding more opportunities to build that trust. If, um, if crate training is a necessity and that has to be done and you're the only one that can do it, then I would find whatever way necessary to, to um, find as much time as needed to crate train uh, and spend your time on that. But the thing with crate training is that's a really challenging behavior too because especially if you're using a, a very kennel, you're asking your bird to go into a dark place. Uh, birds tend to be a little more comfortable in an open wire uh, carrier where they can see out. Um, but again, you're asking them to go into a small space. So you're asking them to be vulnerable. So the more that you can build your relationship with nice, easy, simple behaviors that don't require that high level of trust, you're going to be building so many layers of trust that when you later go on to ask them to step up or ask them to do crate training, they'll be more willing to learn because now you have a stronger relationship um, and a, a full piggy bank, a full trust account. Yeah, yeah, those, those are really good tips. And I think this is one of those situations as well where it might be a case of like a consultation where, people, where you know, you can get a little bit more information. There may be other triggers occurring in the environment that are, are kind of contributing to that level of fear that you're seeing from that bird as well. So um, I think that sometimes thinking in terms of um, working with someone to get that more kind of detailed history and personalized assistance can be really helpful too. So, yeah, the consultations are so great um, because, be, because when you're consulting with somebody that has a lot of experience reading bird body language, they can start to help you see things that you may not already be able to see and really learning to read their body language. You know, one of the things that I learned working with birds is they can communicate so many different things just based on how their feathers lay and how their eyes look. And they have so many feathers, so there's so much communication that's there. And the more we learn to read it and, and kind of have that two-way communication, that two-way conversation, um, the more our relationship grows. And the consultations are great because we can go through that journey together and you know we can help you see small things that you can change in your body language that can make big differences in building trust. Yeah, absolutely. I agree so much. Uh, and I know it's um, people don't realize how much our body language and how we're standing and holding and moving can have such a, like an incredible effect on our animal learners. Um, and that's especially true, I think, with parrots being, you know, a prey species who are really, really switched on to what's going in, on in the environment around them. So, yeah, yeah. Cool. We've got a couple more questions. So we've got two questions here that are about similar questions. They're both about blue and gold macaws screaming. <laughs> One, mm. I think, is someone that you're familiar with. So I'm going to read both questions out because I feel like we can probably um, potentially kind of touch base on both of them at the same time. So the first is from Candy. Candy Hi. says, my blue and gold... My blue and gold macaw has begun to scream all of the time. He screams in his cage, on my shoulder, that sounds painful, <laughs> and on his stand. I'm running out of solutions. We've discussed previously. Any new thoughts on Mav? Oh. And then we have another one from Bradley and Cassandra Watson who say uh, that they have a blue and gold macaw. She's almost three. She has an inside and an outside cage. She loves human interaction and likes to scream. She has two play stands, toys in her cages, and a foliage ball. She drives us crazy with her screaming. Have you any suggestions? She has a great diet of vegetables, pellets, nuts, and some fruit. Please help. Screaming. Um, yeah. yeah. Screaming. <laughs> screaming is such a tough one. You know, it really is. So the first thing that um, 
you know, I always go to again is wild parrot behavior. So parrots scream in the wild, almost all. I don't know if African gray scream, um, but a lot of parrots scream in the wild. So why do they scream in the wild? Why do parrots vocalize in the wild? So um, they have a contact call. So they will scream or vocalize to their mate or their family group. So they'll say, hey, how you doing? I'm good, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Contact call, right? Making sure everybody's okay. Um, they also have an alarm call. So that's, um, if there's danger, there's a scream that they make there that says, you know, sends all the birds flying, right? So that's another type of scream. Um, and parrots will also vocalize um, to show their well-being. And we know that parrots are vocal creatures. So now we look at parrots in our home. So when we're working on uh, screaming, this, again, I think is one that's really well suited to consultations because uh, there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of reasons why it's happening. But usually... It all comes down to behavior and consequence. So from the parrot's perspective, when I scream, what is the consequence? And most often um, it's our attention that is maintaining the screaming. So there's a couple things that happen. Some people will say, when my bird screams, I will walk in the room and cover the cage. And for that bird, just walking in the room could be attention enough to cause the screaming to continue. What I say is that if there's a bit pattern of behavior, if screaming is continuing, then what that means is from the bird's perspective, the bird is finding value in screaming. So we need to figure out what is the value in screaming for the bird? What is the consequence that this bird is trying to gain in screaming? And most often it's our attention. So then people will say, well, I try to ignore it, but that doesn't work. And it's true. Ignoring it doesn't work. And the reason why is because there is a function to that scream. And in the wild, again, parrots are not alone. Parrots are with their, their flock mates. They're with their mates. And so it, ignoring it means that we're just ignoring the fact that they have a need for our attention. And so if we don't give them what they need and we completely ignore them, then we can see worse behaviors start like feather destructive behavior. So the key is to um, develop a plan that involves giving your bird the attention that they're looking for, for um, any vocalization or any sound that is not a scream while at the same time ignoring screaming. But you can't just ignore screaming because you need to help that bird know that if you um, if there's an alarm or if you need to check on me, if you want me, if you need me, there's a way that you can get me through vocalizing. Um, with Parrot Kindergarten, uh, Jen sent everybody a bell. So she trained a lot of these birds to ring bells instead of screaming. So when I ring the bell, my person shows up instead of when I scream, my person shows up. Uh, and that's been super effective. Um, but I look at whenever I find myself saying, I want my bird to stop doing something. I want my bird to stop screaming. Then I say, what do you want him to do instead? And the first thing is to figure out what is the function of this screaming? If the function is to get my attention, what do you prefer he do to get your attention instead? And then let's start training that. So let's give him lots of attention when he does the things that we like then at the same time we can ignore screaming. That kind of system works because the bird is getting that function, that attention, that need filled just by doing an alternative behavior. If we think the bird is screaming, like, um, you know, Candy, you and I have talked a lot and, you know, we'll continue to talk. Your, your case is very complex because unfortunately in your situation, sometimes you have no choice but to reinforce the screaming because you need to interrupt it. And by showing up to interrupt it, we're also reinforcing it. Um, but if we don't think it's screaming for attention, if we think it's a scream for something else, my bird screams uh maybe it's when he wants to go inside if he's outside he screams to go inside um once we recognize that then again what can i teach him to do instead to go inside my dog was howling at me when he wanted to go inside i taught him to ring a bell when he wants to come inside because i prefer ringing a bell to howling at me especially in my urban neighborhood um, so yeah, so screaming is definitely hardwired. And then the other thing that I will say about it is, 
I don't think it's realistic to expect to share your home with a parrot and have a silent home. Um, parrots are just noisy animals and it's not realistic or healthy, I don't think. I think if you have a quiet parrot, I would be concerned about their health. What do you think, yeah. Lee? I know, I know screaming is a big challenge and I know it can tear up a family. I know it's no joke. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's certainly by far probably one of the hardest behaviours um, that we get asked about. I mean, feather destructive behaviour obviously has a really emotional um, side to it that's really difficult, but screaming is by far one of the probably the most common reasons that birds get rehomed because it does, um, like you say, tear their families apart and, and cause a lot of friction within the family environment. But um, everything that you say is... It, exactly what we, we recommend so I'm listening to you and I'm like yeah I have <laughs> very little extra to add here um on top of that I mean it, it's like you said it's one of those ones where consultation is the best option because we can dig into those um that behavior history and find out exactly what may be triggering it because not every scream is the same as well um so you know we've had clients where the bird was screaming because there was something nutritionally missing from the bird's diet and that needed to be rectified. And when it was, the screaming stopped that way. So there are many different areas that need to be explored to make sure that we're meeting all of those needs for the animal, like you said. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other big challenge with screaming is, you know, there's, there's the variable schedule that often happens where, um, my bird is screaming and I say, I'm going to ignore this. I'm just going to ignore it. And after two minutes, I just can't take it anymore. And I get up and I walk in the room. Some people will yell back at their bird, which from the bird's perspective could very well be reinforcing. Yay, we're screaming together. But, but the important thing is that if I, if I, you know, I'm ignoring it, I'm ignoring it. And after two minutes I go, oh my gosh, I can't take it. And I walk in that room what I've just told my bird is, if you scream for two minutes, I will show up. Well, so then I go back and I say, man, I messed up. This time I'm really going to ignore him. I'm not going to go in. And now after 10 minutes, I go in. So now I've just taught him, just keep screaming. Eventually I'll come in. And the way that, that we kind of describe it in the science of behavior or the way I like to describe it is um, if you imagine that you just bought a brand new house and you walk in the house and you flip the light switch and the light comes on and you flip it down and the light turns off. Every single time you flip the light switch, the light comes on or the light goes off. All of a sudden, one day you flip the light switch and the light doesn't come on. What do you do? I change the light bulb period. That's it. I don't continue flipping the light switch, right? My house is a hundred years old. So let's say I have a sticky light switch. And for me, sometimes when I flip it, I have to flip it two or three times before the light finally triggers on. Um, and sometimes it's four or five times. So what do I do? Well, I'll stand there. Let's say the light bulb is burnt. I don't know. I'm flicking this light switch now for 10 minutes waiting for this light to come on because I have this variable schedule of light coming on. So it's the same thing with the scream. If sometimes we reinforce, you know, after they scream for a minute and sometimes it's three minutes, that bird is going to keep flipping that switch, keep screaming until we finally show up versus every time they scream, let's say we reinforce them and then all of a sudden we stop reinforcing them, then hypothetically the scream should stop. But again, it doesn't because there's a need and we have to fill that need with another more desirable behavior. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, those those variable schedules, they can be great if we're wanting to train something like duration stationing. Not so great if we're inadvertently teaching our bird to scream for hours on end. So Exactly. It's the same principle, yeah. but it gets us not where we want to be. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. Cool. All right, we've got another question here from Hayden. So Hayden says, he has um, a kayak as well. We spend as much time as possible together, but there are times where he needs to sit tight in his cage, for instance, when they're cooking. Do you have any tips for making cage time more fun and less stressful? We have toys and treats, but he, is still, he still gets rather upset with separation um, and he focuses on things like rattling the cage door. Yeah, so one of the things that can help is if your bird... Um, 
is in in close enough proximity so they can see you. So um, at least this way you're not, you know, when cooking time is happening, he still can be near you so he can see you kind of be part of the action, you know, but still stay safe. Um, the other thing is, yes, I think about um, not just that he has treats and toys, but can he get some novel treats and toys? So can dinner time, when, when it's time to put him in his cage for dinner time, when it's time to cook, uh, are there toys that he loves better than anything else, like foraging boxes filled with treats um, or something to shred or even um, any toys that, that um, you can add treats to, even if you're using like a little bit of almond butter and sticking some, some seeds on it throughout or something like that. The goal is during the time when I'm cooking, what do I want him to do instead and how do I set up that environment for that? And if playing with toys is what I wish he would do, um, sometimes offering new toys at that time, if he's not afraid of new things, can be something that inspires him. Or extra special toys that he only gets during those times when you're cooking. Um, and if he won't play with them, then during the non-cooking times, that's a time to to spend some time training him to play with his toys. And you can do that with target training uh, and some other ways as well. But the more you can teach him to interact with different items, then it opens up your toolbox for different items that you can use to um, give him things to do during those times when you're not available. What do you think, yeah. Lee? Yeah, I feel like yeah. I'm just nodding and agreeing with you, but that, <laughs> that would be what I would recommend as well as I'd be, yeah, like utilizing some food foraging or um, some activities that are kind of special and kept aside for that time of the day um, so yeah. that we can keep him busy and help him feel a little bit more comfortable and happier in that in that setup because it is you know realist like realistically we just can't have them with us all of the time it's not safe for them to do so uh, so we need to be able to set them up um, and encourage them to be able to play independently at those times and I think yeah. Yeah, toys, you know, novel toys um, and food foraging opportunities can be a great way to help them feel. Um, and I think it's it's more about food foraging. And I don't know if um, when Hayden said that there's treats available, whether that's just a case of we pop some treats in a bowl. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe we can uh, start, you know, building on some foraging. And if you've not done a lot of foraging, um, maybe maybe you need to do a bit of intro to foraging as well, which we do have a video on in our Facebook group if, anyone is not sure how to introduce foraging to their parents for the first time uh, so you can find that there uh, but yeah that's a really good way to to help them feel more more comfortable with that kind of setup for the time being yeah and there might be other fun things that you can explore I'm always thinking about outside the box ideas too you know like maybe you put on some music and maybe you know your bird dances with you a little bit while he's in his cage or you sing to each other or you contact call um, while you're making dinner, if there's healthy things that your bird can have, if you notice that he is playing independently with toys, that's a great time to walk over and share some of the food that you're making, some extra special treats for playing independently while I cook, you know? Yes. Yeah. And I think also, you know, can you set yourself up for success by, um, you know, are there other times of the day where the bird spends a little bit of time in the cage that they're less I guess, agitated by being in there that we can also work on reinforcing um, for that kind of ideal behaviour of maybe playing with toys or hanging out and preening. Um, so, you know, are there other times of the day where they're a little bit less agitated? Because I do find some birds are like, you're in the kitchen, I know that's where the food comes from. So they get a little bit more, they might be a little bit more worked up in that, in that particular setting. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. All right. Well, I think... I don't see any more questions just yet, um, which is perfect because we're coming up on just close to an hour now. Um, so before we finish up, do you have any other little little tips or advice you want to share with anyone? Hmm. hmm. Tips or advice. I, I guess what I would say is if there's one thing that I've learned um, from working with the parrot kindergarten group is that um, – there's so much value to just at the very least um, choosing to set aside three to five minutes, three days a week to spend quality one-on-one -on -one time with your bird. 
where um, whatever that looks like, if you're doing target training while they're in the cage, maybe color discrimination, maybe it's voluntary nail trim, whatever is important to you. But three to five minutes, um, you know, three days a week of some training time can make a world of difference. And if you love it and you want to do more, more is always better. Um, but I think what's important is that all of our lives are different and unique and we all love our birds and we all want what's best for our birds. And I don't think that there's ever one black and white answer. I think it's the, the beauty in getting a consultation. Um, well, at least the, the way I consult, I, I'm very collaborative. So for me, I'm always looking at you know, tell me about your family life and what's important to you and what do you need out of your relationship with your bird? And that's the avenue that we'll take because um, everybody's different and everybody has um, different things that they bring to the table. Um, but all these birds, um, they, they just benefit so greatly from just that little bit of, of time spent getting to know them better and really developing that, that two-way communication. And I think that's really the other key is that training is two-way communication. Um, when we want our birds to do a behavior, that's half of it. They bring the other half to the table in how they react to what we ask. And that's where the conversation, the awesome, beautiful, amazing conversation really happens, you know? So the more we get to read their behavior and body language and the more we're comfortable to respond to what they're giving us and, you know, the less we think, um, this bird has to do this thing now, the more we think about it as a conversation um, instead of, you know, an argument. <laughs> uh, I think that that there's a lot of great things um, that, that come out of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, you, you know, when we talk about uh, the science of behavior, we talk about things that are reinforcing to animals, things that animals will work to gain. And, you know, we all can clearly see and understand that food, water, shelter, these things are primary reinforcers. These are things that all animals need to be safe. And the science says that choice and control are control is a primary reinforcer. So having the opportunity to have control over my environment is a need that all animals have. So when we give our birds a voice in the conversation and we, we give them the, the choice and control if they're not interested in doing what we ask and they say no through their body language that we respect that and we give them the right to say no. And we take that no as a, a challenge for us to figure out, okay, well, how do, I, how do I encourage them to want to? What can I change so that they will want to? What can I change to make the right behavior easier? And I think if we reflect on ourselves every time we think about our birds, what can I do differently? How can I make it better? Um, then we go a long way towards fixing it. I think one of the, the biggest uh, roadblocks or speed bumps to growing our relationships with our birds is um, when we just label them and we just leave it at that. He's obstinate, he's uh, hormonal, he's jealous. Um, whatever the dominant. case may be, he's dominant. Um, you know, I always say, what does that look like? And, and I don't know what an animal thinks or feels, but I know what they do. And if somebody says, um, somebody said to me, um, my bird flew out and bit me. I think it's he, because he's mad because of what I did yesterday. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I do know that if I focus on the behavior that I'm seeing right now, I open the cage and my bird flies out and bites me. What can I do differently next time? How can I set up the environment? Maybe I station train my bird and my bird, I ask my bird to stay on a station and I only open the door while he's on that station so that I have the time to set myself up to be ready for my bird to fly out. But I try not to think about, you know, what, why maybe he did it based on something that I, I don't know. And I just look at the behavior in front of me. Um, another thing that I think is a great tip is throw up a, a camera and videotape your interactions with your bird 
and um, go back and watch it later because sometimes we don't know why our birds do things. Sometimes we think they bite for no reason, but if we go back and we watch and we play it back and we play it back in slow motion and we show it to our family members, everybody sees something different and you can see something different if you watch it three times. You can watch it from three different perspectives and it can really help you generate some ideas to get over those speed bumps or get through those challenges. Yes, really good tips. I really like that. Thanks. It's awesome. Uh, so before we finish up, and, and lots of people have said thank you very much. So oh, um, cool. everyone thank sort you. of said thank you. And uh, so you, you're all welcome. Thanks for coming and asking such um, fantastic questions and giving us the opportunity to have a chat about these things and get this out there to to other people as well. I'm sure there are people watching that maybe aren't um, haven't asked a question but have found the information informative as well. So before we finish up, I will, um, so you can find uh, Cassie online, obviously. So she is at Awesome Animal Solutions. This is her Facebook page. She also has a website, which you can access from the Facebook page as well. Uh, so if you need to, if you want to get in touch with her, set up a consultation, read some of her published works, you can find that all there on her website. Um, and she is also involved with Jen Corner's Parrot Kindergarten, um, and we did a live Q&A with Jen a couple of weeks ago that you can find in our Facebook group as well if you want to listen um, and hear a little bit more about what Jen's doing with um, parrot communication and tablet training and all of that fun community that they're building over there with their parrot kindergarten. And I think we've got a few um, parrot kindergarten people here today asking questions, which has been really fun. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is there any other way people can contact you just, just through Facebook or is email? Yeah, uh, anything is good. Uh, Facebook is great. On my website, there's a contact form. That'll go to my email. Um, yeah, that's that's a great way to reach out initially, and then we'll get to chatting from there. And yeah, I do awesome. want to say also, as far as um, my prices on my website, um, they're a little confusing. But the most important thing is that um, I offer package deals that are discounted and I work really hard to work within your budget. Uh, for me, I am super passionate about animals and animal welfare and helping people uh, have awesome lives with their pets. And so I want to do that and find a price that works for you. So if you feel like my prices are high, I hope that that doesn't scare you away. Please reach out and we can talk and we can see what we can work out. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for coming along today and sharing all of your wisdom and experience and all of that, that 20 years of knowledge of working with not just parrots, but a variety of bird and other species. I think it brings a lot to the table for everybody to kind of listen in and, and get some of that wisdom from you. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. This was so fun. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope we get to do it again sometime. I Absolutely sure we can organise that. And thank you again to everybody for their questions. Yeah. That's it for today. Have a fantastic Sunday for everybody over here on the in the Southern Hemisphere. And I guess it's nearly Sunday for you guys over there. So <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.